In our last lecture, we discussed key political events of the 1790s and the age of Jefferson, speaking about some of the contradictions of Thomas Jefferson's life and career. In this unit, we're going to discuss how the United States changed, particularly in economic terms, from 1809 to 1837. For much of this lecture, however, we will discuss Jacksonian democracy and the significance of Andrew Jackson's two terms as president from 1829 to 1837. The purpose of that discussion is to speak about the broader social, cultural, and political implications of Jackson's presidency. In the decades before Andrew Jackson assumed office, many American leaders from the Revolutionary Era, like Alexander Hamilton, were elites skeptical of giving all white men, especially the uneducated and the impoverished, the right to vote, fearing it would lead to quote-unquote mob rule. During Jackson's time as a president, though, Americans took important steps towards becoming a full democracy for all white men, regardless of their class or status. The book, rather accurately, describes the societal transformation in the 1820s and 1830s as, quote, the triumph of white men's democracy, end quote. Remember, in this period, and for many, many years into the future, the U.S. government denied equal rights to African Americans, women, Native Americans, and other groups. But, even in spite of this recognition, the 1820s and 1830s were a period of significant democratic progress for the country. This story is inseparable from Andrew Jackson. Let's take some time to discuss how America changed economically from the end of Thomas Jefferson's presidency in 1809 until Andrew Jackson took political office in 1829. Perhaps most importantly, the United States changed dramatically in terms of its geographic size and economic infrastructure. While the country had initially consisted of 13 colonies on the eastern seaboard, after Jefferson's presidency, the landmass controlled by the United States doubled as a result of the Louisiana Purchase. Americans began moving west into these lands in increasingly large numbers after 1815. Settlers particularly flocked to what was called the Mississippi Territory, consisting of the present-day states of Mississippi, Alabama, and the Panhandle of Florida, and the Appalachians, consisting of western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, and Georgia. Only one-seventh of the U.S. population lived in these vast areas by 1810. In 1840, though, one-third did. Over those 30 years, eight new western states were added to the Union as settlers took advantage of fertile soil in those territories. Settlers moving into these areas faced many hardships. While speculators often bought up much of the land, the bread and butter of settler experience, of settler expansion, was the pioneer family. Farmers and their families often moved into the middle of nowhere, literally building a home out of the wilderness and clearing land to raise crops. They often only grew enough to survive, and sometimes a little extra, to sell off at market to pay the debts they acquired from buying land. But, generally speaking, these small settlements often survived largely in isolation and had to be self-sufficient. Crops had to be planted, grown, and harvested, often with no more than an axe, a, pl a plow, and a, and a spinning wheel. Men cut down trees, built cabins, broke the soil, and planted crops. Women made clothes, manufactured soap from animal fat, churned butter, worked in the fields, and stored food for winter, all on top of raising children. Pioneer families frequently extended aid to other families in need, although, quote, close neighbors might live five to ten miles away. As settlers moved west, the American economy changed dramatically in the early 19th century. Major transformations in the country's infrastructure helped spur on broad economic growth. For instance, in the first decades of the 1800s, a new transportation network emerged on land and water that enabled farmers and merchants to move and sell produce and goods at much greater distances. To facilitate economic growth, the federal government played a critical role in financing improved transportation networks. In 1815, President James Madison, who had been vice president under Thomas Jefferson, supported the use of federal funds for, quote, internal improvements, like building roads. As a result, the federal government built the country's first major gravel surface road between Cumberland, Maryland, on the Potomac River, to Wheeling, Virginia, on the Ohio River. This road was later extended to Illinois by 1838. In the 1820s, moreover, the government financed thousands of miles of road networks in southern New England, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, and, and northern New Jersey. These roads helped stir on commerce, but were still not economically viable for many farmers to ship produce to faraway markets. To solve this problem, farmers took advantage of rivers to move their goods to market. For example, farmers in Ohio and Illinois could use the Mississippi River to move their goods to New Orleans. From there, goods could be shipped via the Gulf of Mexico to international markets. The government spurred on the use of rivers as a means of improving economic expansion 
through funding canal systems that connect different rivers and enable farmers to sell their crops at greater distances. The most famous of these canals, the Erie Canal, was created from 1818 to 1825 when New York State sold bonds to the public to finance the digging of that canal. The Erie Canal ended up being 364 miles long, 40 feet wide, and just 4 feet deep. It connected a great lake, Lake Erie, to a river flowing into the Atlantic Ocean. The Erie Canal enabled farmers in western New York to move their goods to faraway port cities. The invention of steamboats in 1807 drastically improved these river transportation networks in terms of speed and efficiency. A key consequence of these networks was that western farmers no longer had to personally sell their own goods. They could travel to the Erie Canal, for example, and ship their goods east for sale at markets. In turn, eastern merchants could use these transportation systems to sell manufactured, manufactured items in the west. As the economy improved, farmers often sold their goods to merchants who then shipped items west for them. When they, with the economy improving, these merchants often lent credit to merchants or to farmers to buy seed and needed planting tools, and those same merchants received credit from larger merchants in major cities. These developments helped the American economy grow significantly and raised the quality of life for many citizens. From 1800 to 1840, agricultural output from farmers increased by 3% every single year. The economy also experienced the growth of the country's first factories in the early 1800s. Before 1815, most manufacturing in the U.S. was done in local mills or by artisans using their hands to make clothes or boots on a small scale. However, the invention of spinning, ma spinning machines and the power loom in the late 1700s gave rise to the country's first cotton mills. These were the factories with machines that could spin cotton fibers into clothes. These first factories remained small and isolated, though. By 1840, only 10% of all Americans worked in these tight mills or factories. This was only the beginning of a much larger industrial transformation that would come later in the century. Now, a critical part of this economic growth was that the U.S. was experiencing urban growth as new cities appeared across the country. In 1800, only 6% of America's 5 million people lived in towns of more than 2,500 people. And just two cities, New York and Philadelphia, had a population larger than 50,000. By 1850, though, almost 20% of America's 23 million people lived in towns of more than 25,000 people. New cities, like St. Louis and Chicago, appeared throughout the country. These urban areas provided critical buyers for agricultural goods and manufactured items. One of the most brilliant parts of the American political system was its division of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. In this context, the Supreme Court asserted itself in the early 1800s as an extremely important governmental body in American life. From 1801 to 1835, John Marshall served as the Chief Justice of the Court. From 1819 to 1824, Marshall used the Supreme Court to grant the federal government greater economic powers over individual states in two major court cases that set significant precedents for the future. The most famous case of Marshall's era was McCulloch v. Maryland. This case occurred when the state of Maryland passed a state tax on a U.S. National Bank branch in Baltimore. The Supreme Court dealt with two major legal issues in this case. One, did the U.S. have the right to have a national bank? Two, did a state have the right to tax a federal entity? The Supreme Court ruled that even though the Constitution did not specifically say the federal government had the right to have a national bank, the federal government could legally create a national bank through the, quote, implied powers of the Constitution, meaning the U.S. government, in Marshall's opinion, had general powers to help foster economic growth and that every one of its powers did not have to be spelled out in the Constitution because how could the founders have anticipated every potential need of the country? This was a remarkably important precedent that made the Supreme Court enduringly relevant in American life. With regard to the second legal question, Marshall rejected the notion that a state could tax a federal agency, such as a national U.S. bank branch. Giving a state the power to tax a federal entity, Marshall argued, would create chaos. Another major case of Marshall's ten tenure was Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824. This, this case occurred after New York State granted a steamboat company a monopoly over water nav navigation routes for ferries between New York and New Jersey. But since these routes passed over state lines into New Jersey, another ferry company sued, arguing that New York's actions were illegal. Marshall's Supreme Court agreed, ruling that only Congress had the right to control interstate commerce. This firmly established federal dominance over state governments in regulating interstate trade and preventing larger economic arguments between states. 
Let's move on and discuss the emergence of Jacksonian democracy in the 1820s. While democracy was essentially a dirty word in prior decades, the term took on a new meaning throughout the 1820s and 1830s. The public remembered the revolutionary arguments of the founders that the people, not any king, were the ultimate power in the United States. And, as a consequence, white American males began to demand greater political rights and equal political and economic opportunities in the 1820s. In this context, Jacksonian democracy was a time in which lower socioeconomic white men were inspired, in part, by the resonating public memory of the American Revolution and their interpretation of what its ideals had meant to demand greater inclusion in American society, even as sexism, racism, and other injustices remained pervasive in the United States, a public demand arose for inclusion of all free white men in the political process, leading to greater governmental efforts towards ensuring political and social democratization. These developments helped encourage a broader democratic consciousness in American life during the 1820s and 1830s. Americans began to reject elite-style clothes. White men forced most states to end property qualifications for the right to vote. The percentage of white men voting in the U.S. tripled. Larger numbers of Americans participated in political debates through newspapers and other print sources. People demanded that elites not be allowed to dominate the economy. Greater numbers of, of public officials were directly elected rather than appointed by governors or state legislatures. Delegates to the Electoral College, who would vote for the president, were almost completely picked by popular elections for the first time. American society was becoming more responsive to the public and, slowly but surely, more democratic. Of course, no one is more important in the discussion of Jacksonian democracy than Andrew Jackson. A brief discussion of his past demonstrates why. Andrew Jackson was born in March 1767 in the Piedmont area, somewhere between North and South Carolina. South Carolina. His parents were immigrants from Ireland and had come to America just two years before his birth. Jackson's father died less than a month before he was born at the age of 29. When the Revolutionary War started, Jackson took part as a 13-year-old boy serving as a courier for a, lo a local militia. In June of 1779, Jackson was captured with one of his brothers. While being held captive, at one point, Jackson refused to clean a British officer's boots and was hit in the face with the officer's sword, leaving a large scar on his head and his hand where he sought to block the officer's sword. Jackson and his brother were released from captivity after Jackson's mother talked British soldiers into letting them go. But both brothers were sick with smallpox. Jackson survived, but his brother died at home and his mother died soon after of cholera. Thus, at just age 14, his parents and entire family were dead. He blamed the British and hated them intensely. Despite this great adversity, Andrew Jackson was an extremely tough teenager not to be trifled with. One historian described him as follows. Andy entered his 13th year after, Andy entered his 13th year, a tall, lean, remarkably agile, freckle-faced boy with bright blue eyes, a shock of tousled hair that was almost red and a temper in keeping. He would fight at the drop of a hat, by that means mitigating a misfortune that would have ruined the prestige of an ordinary boy. And he had a habit of quote-unquote slobbering, which he was unable to control until almost grown, but had just at this circumstance spelled combat, whatever the odds, end quote. Jackson's education was irregular growing up. He studied law on his own in Salisbury, North Carolina, after the Revolutionary War, and was admitted to the bar in 1787. Thereafter, he moved to western North Carolina, what was known as the Southwest Territory, and what would later become the state of Tennessee to practice law. After Tennessee became a state in 1796, Jackson became a U.S. congressman, serving for a year before resigning and serving as a judge in his home state until 1804. Jackson, however, was not only a lawyer and politician, but also a planter and businessman. He started with a small farm and nine slaves and later become a, became a reasonably wealthy plantation owner with 150 African American slaves. As an adult, Jackson remained a man not to be trifled with, especially in a 19th century culture of honor in which one's reputation meant everything. Insults were not taken lightly. This type of thought consequentially led Jackson to fight duels in his life. For example, in May of 1806, Jackson challenged a man named Charles Dickinson to duel for a newspaper article Dickinson wrote attacking Jackson. Unfortunately for Jackson, Dickinson was renowned as an expert shot with a pistol. How these duels worked was you had to march a certain number of steps away from each other, facing away, before turning and shooting when commanded. However, you didn't have to shoot immediately. You could choose to not shoot quickly, gambling that the other person would miss you by firing in a hurry, and then you could take your time firing back. 
Thus, Jackson decided the best way for him to win the duel was to let Dickinson shoot first. In the actual duel, one historian described the duel as follows. After Dickinson fired first in the duel, a fleck of dust rose from Jackson's coat and his left hand clutched his chest. For an instant, he thought himself dying, but fighting for self-command, slowly he raised his pistol. Dickinson recalled, recoiled a step horror-stricken. My God, have I missed him? Overton, Jackson's friend and second in the duel, presented his pistol. Back to the mark, sir. Dickinson folded his arms. Jackson's spare frame straightened. He aimed and fired. Dickinson swayed to the ground and later died. Jackson, too, was wounded to the point where his left, left boot had filled with blood. Jackson's surgeon found that Dickinson's aim had been perfectly true and only missed his heart by inches, but he had judged the position of Jackson's heart by the set of his coat, and Jackson wore his coats loosely on account of the excessive slenderness of his figure. So, while the bullet shattered two ribs and would never be removed since it was so close to Jackson's heart, he survived, though he could barely move for a month. While one would have expected Jackson to fall down from his wound, thus ending the duel, Jackson later said, quote, I would have hit him if he'd shot me through the brain. Thus, when we speak about Jackson as a hardened man of the people, an anti-elitist, this is the individual we're talking about. Andrew Jackson first distinguished himself on a national level during the War of 1812 between the United States and Britain. The war was over the forcing of U.S. sailors into the British Navy and other perceived insults to the national honor. During that conflict, when the British threatened to capture New Orleans in January 1815, Jackson commanded 5,000 militia soldiers in its defense, overwhelmingly defeating the British and inflicting enormous casualties. This victory made Jackson famous throughout the nation. Moving on to the 1820s, Jackson was a widely popular figure in Tennessee, becoming a U.S. Senator from that state before be being nominated by the state's legislature to run as a presidential candidate in the election of 1824. Running against three other opponents from the Democratic-Republican Party, the only major political party in 1824, Jackson won the popular vote, but failed to win over 50% of the Electoral College. Because there was no majority winner in the Electoral College, the House of Representatives decided the election. John Quincy Adams, the son of former President John Adams, won the presidency in the House of, Re House of Representatives vote after Henry Clay, another candidate who ran against Jackson, convinced his supporters to vote for Adams. Thereafter, Clay received an appointment as Secretary of State from President John Quincy Adams, leading Jackson to argue that, quote, a corrupt bargain had been made. By 1828, the Democratic-Republican Party split into two parties, the National Republicans and the Democratic Party. Jackson was nominated again for the presidency, challenging President John Quincy Adams as a Democratic candidate. The election was one of the first modern political campaigns in American history. For the first time, political parties used public rallies and campaign events to attract supporters. Rumors and negative attacks were used by both candidates as the election turned dirty. Jackson won that presidential election decisively because he was seen as a man of the people. Jackson came from nothing. He had a backwoods upbringing. His lack of a formal education only endeared him to many more Americans. He was a hugely popular military hero. His opponent, John Quincy Adams, on the contrary, was seen as an aristocrat, born into affluence and an elitist lifestyle. On March 4, 1829, Andrew Jackson was inaugurated as president. While previous inaugurations had been invitation only, Jackson opened his to the public by having, out, having it outside near the Capitol building. Jackson walked to the event and spoke before 21,000 people, the vast majority of which probably couldn't hear him. After the address, Jackson rode a white horse to the White House, followed by, quote, countrymen, farmers, gentlemen on horse and foot, women, boys, black and white. What followed that evening was a raucous post-inaugural party at the White House. While previous such events had also been an uh, invitation only, a huge public party took place in the White House after Jackson's speech. As one Supreme Court justice stated, the party included, quote, the highest and most polished down to the most vulgar and gross in the nation. I never saw such a mixture. The reign of King Mob seemed triumph triumphant. The party was, apparently, out of control. Barrels of orange liquor punch were drank. Fights broke out. Drunken men with muddy boots stood, stood on expensive, elegant sofas. Long story short, in true democratic fashion, the White House was trashed and thousands of dollars of China was broken before the night was over. Jackson, for his own safety, exited early through a window as the party grew out of control. The point of this story is that Jackson's election to many Americans represented the manifestation of a much greater degree of democratization in U.S. society that flew in the face of elitism and privilege. Judging Jackson's presidency from 1829 to 1837 remains complex. In one context, 
His time in office was a period of greater democratization in American life that helped the country inch ever so gradually towards embracing its founding principles. And yet, in another sense, Jackson's legacy remains deeply tarnished by his inhumane treatment of Native Americans. For example, the first major political priority of Jackson's presidency was the issue of quote-unquote Indian removal. As a candidate for the presidency, Jackson spoken of the need to force Native Americans to move west of the Mississippi River from Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, and other states, to open the way for more white settlement in the South. The largest Native Americans in that area, the Cherokee Nation, had established a Republican-like government. They, like others, refused to move. When Georgia and Alabama began to force tribes in their states to follow prejudicial state laws, something illegal since only the federal government could pass laws on Native Americans, Jackson supported the states, even after the Supreme Court ruled differently. Jackson argued that states' rights trumped those of Native Americans and called for their forceful removal to a new territory in Oklahoma. Thus, from 1830 to 1838, the Jackson administration forced the removal of 46,000 Native Americans, including much of the Cherokee, Muscogee, Seminole, and Choctaw tribes from parts of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. The movement of the Cherokee Nation in particular became known as the Trail of Tears, in which 4,000 people died from starvation, disease, and exposure while being forced to move to the new territory in Oklahoma. These actions, which some have gone so far to describe as ethnic cleansing, remain a shameful part of Jackson's legacy. However, one major event of Jackson's presidency, in which he acted sagely as a strong president, was the nullification crisis. This crisis occurred when the state of South Carolina attempted to nullify a federal law, an 1828 tariff, meaning a tax, that Congress had passed on the importation of low-priced foreign goods. This tariff was passed to protect northern industries from foreign competition by making foreign goods more expensive than American ones. However, as European companies made less money as a result of the American tariff, they purchased less raw goods from the South, like cotton, hurting the southern economy. Thus, South Carolina was concerned that these type of tariffs, and more generally, federal control of the economy, would lead to, lead to grave economic damage in the South, as Northerners sought to benefit manufacturing interests at the South's expense. With this understanding, in 1832, South Carolina nullified tariff laws from 1828 and 1832, ruling them unconstitutional and arguing that any state had the right to nullify a federal law they deemed unconstitutional. South Carolina even went so far to threaten to secede from the Union over the right of nullification. While Andrew Jackson was a proponent of small federal government and of states' rights, he did not believe states should be allowed to exercise such power over federal laws. As a result, Jackson immediately denounced nullification as tantamount to treason and warned of grave consequences for South Carolina if it attempted to secede from the Union. Jackson appealed to South Carolinians, warning, warning them, quote, as a father would over his children whom he saw rushing to certain ruin. On your unhappy state will inevitably fall all the evils of this conflict you force upon the government of this country. The Constitution's destroyers you cannot be. You may disturb its peace, you may interrupt the course of its prosperity, you may cloud its reputation for stability, but its tranquility will it'll be restored, will be restored, its prosperity will return, and the stain upon its national character will be transferred, remain an eternal blot on the memory of those who caused the disorder. Jackson always, a man to be taken seriously, said plainly, quote, this union by, by armed force is treason, end quote. As South Carolina backed down from its threats to leave the Union, the president supported a compromise tariff bill that lowered the tariff, and South Carolina rescinded its nullification resolution in 1833. This was a great moment for American history. If states Jackson understood could declare federal laws illegal, the country would descend into chaos. Another major issue of Jackson's presidency was what, what, was, what was called the Bank War of 1832. A second U.S. national bank had been created in 1817 and was a chartered monopoly given greater economic power as a federal entity. The federal government owned 20% of the bank's assets, while 4,000 people, including 1,000 Europeans, owned the rest. Jackson and many Americans viewed the U.S. bank as the epitome of elite, con elite control of the economy, and as a symbol of elite power, Americans widely blamed the U.S. bank for economic problems in their midst. Running successfully for re-election in 1832, Jackson vowed to end the U.S. bank, telling his vice president at one point, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. When Congress voted to renew the bank's charter in 1832, Jackson vetoed the legislation as unconstitutional in June of that year. In doing so, Jackson explained his rationale as follows. In the full enjoyment of the gifts of heaven and the fruits of superior industry, economy, and virtue, every man 
is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to grant exclusive privileges, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers, who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government." End quote. Jackson's energetic actions to end the bank were widely popular, and he won re-election decisively, decisively in 1832. Even the supporters of the bank used money and influence to stop his re-election. After continued struggles between Jackson and the U.S. Bank proponents, U.S. Bank's proponents, its charter ended in 1836 without a renewal. The U.S. Bank's role in fomenting economic problems was dramatically overstated, but Jackson's war on the institution represented his aspirations to rule as a man of the people, as a democratic leader that would advance the common man's interest. Jackson's time in office and his legacy at large, like Thomas Jefferson's before him, remain deeply contradictory, badly tarnished by his treatment of Native Americans. Still, Jackson's greater symbolic importance was the manifestation of broader democratic yearnings that played out in a transforming American society. Despite the country's many remaining injustices, white citizens began to demand that the federal government more genuinely embrace the values of the American Revolution, including phrases like, quote, all men are created equal, end quote. While Jacksonian democracy was indeed the triumph of white men's democracy, it represented a trend of democratization and the ability of ordinary Americans to begin to use the tools of the US political system to force the greater realization of those revolutionary values in the present. This set a remarkably important precedent that other groups like African Americans and women would later make use of in the coming decades and centuries. Thank you for listening.